we get a chance to look around. It's a great facility. I'm biased, but that's, that still doesn't make it any less. Um, I'll be the moderator for today's session. Um, we will have four presentations um, without questions, and then we'll ask the four presenters to come up at the end, and then we'll ask, allow you to ask questions, or have you ask questions of the group. Since the presentations all relate to each other, that seemed like a good way to, to do it, so you can ask questions across the various presenters. Um, each presentation is 25 minutes. I will hold up the, the speakers. I will hold up the infamous sign um, at three minutes. I'll be over here, so waving and stuff. Um, at uh, 25 minutes after, I'll probably creep on the stage and be a nuisance. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Larry Cahoon. He's a professor of biology, marine biology at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. He received his PhD in zoology from Duke University in 1981. Dr. Kuhn is a biological oceanographer and limnologist with interest in primary production, nutrient cycling, and water quality. He has published over 105 peer-reviewed scientific papers and is an elected member of several academic honor societies, such as Phi Beta Sigma, Phi Beta Kappa, and Phi Kappa Phi. And tonight, he will receive the Catalyst Award from the North Carolina League of Conser Conservation, sorry, sorry to say conservative of conservation voters. <laughs> Larry. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. All right. Thank you all for coming. Um, 25 minutes, sorry. It's a quarter of 11, I need to shut up. This is not a happy story. I don't think you expected one, but it is definitely not a happy story. Um, by now you've all heard about Gen X, and some of you know more about it than others, but um, my task today is to try and explain at least some of the pathway that got us where we are. And let's start first by having a look at the molecule. Um, Gen X is a perfluorinated monoether compound. Um, it is generated as both a product sold commercially and as a byproduct of other synthesis processes. It's important to bear that dual nature of it in mind. Um, <clears throat> there are various terms used to name it. We call it Gen X because that's easy to spell. Um, I prefer to call it perfluoro 2 propoxypropanoic acid. <laughs> tongue twister. It has other formal chemical names that are correct. Um, in chemical nomenclature, by the way, there's only one correct way to identify a chemical compound that's unambiguous, and that's by a CAS number 13252-13-6. Kind of like your social security number. <laughs> so when you hear people talk about compounds, the first thing you want to do is ask them the CAS number. All right. <clears throat> now, one of the things that is out there in the public arena is the awareness that there are other compounds present in our water here in the Cape Fear River as a consequence of various discharges. Gen X is a poster child for those. But <clears throat> here's a long list of other things that are out there. Um, I've highlighted a few that are present in very high quantities. Uh, you may have heard of Nathion byproducts. It's a very long list of compounds, so it's a very challenging matrix of compounds to try and identify <coughs> and quantify. Now, Ralph Mead is going to talk to you in a bit about doing some of that and all the fun they've had. One I've identified here in red <coughs> is one of what we call a legacy compound. Um, the informal title is C8, because it's an 8-carbon compound for fluorooctanoic acid, PFOA. That one was commercially produced by DuPont starting a while back, and they've ceased production of it, and it'll turn up later on in some of the documents that I'll refer to. So, what did DuPont and Cam Morris know? When did they know it? It's a popular kind of question these days, isn't it? Here from DuPont? <laughs> okay, well, we're all 
less knowledgeable than those people are. Supposedly, Gen X was discovered as a chemical compound in 1963. According to Chemworks themselves, they began discharging Gen X into the Cape Fear River in 1980. They've been doing it for 38 years. We didn't know that. And we wouldn't have known it if they had not said so in a meeting just about a year ago, uh, June 15th, when Chemwar's people came down to New Hanover County and met with a number of local elected officials and so forth. There was one reporter in the room who took notes. I've seen those notes. They flat out said, oh yeah, we've been putting this in the river all this time. Um, now, one of the things I'm going to tee off on here, in 2002, what was then DuPont, DuPont split Chemwars off in 2015. Uh, so Chemwars is a new company. They inherited the discharge permit and so forth. Uh, DuPont uh, advised the Division of Water Quality um, that they had a problem. And I'm going to go through portions of that letter I've highlighted in red ink there what I call the Johnson letter. Michael Johnson was the environmental manager for DuPont back then, and he's still the environmental manager for uh, Chemwars. And he's the one who put on the table that they've been doing this since 1980. <clears throat> that letter was all about, uh, gee, you know, um, we're discharging this stuff, and we need some guidance from you. And I'm going to walk you through it, because it's very instructive. In 2009, DuPont got consent to produce Gen X commercially as a product. Bear in mind there is a difference between a product for commercial purposes and a byproduct. They've been putting the byproduct Gen X in the water for 29 years at that point. Now they were going to produce it commercially. When you go to produce a new chemical commercially, you go through what we call TOSCA, Toxic Substances Control Act, <coughs> require safety testing and that sort of thing. And they got a consent to produce. It had a number of provisions attached to it, including you may not discharge this into the environment. The workers on the factory floor where this stuff is made have to wear full body suits and respirators because the stuff is very toxic. It will kill you. Not in the small quantities that we're talking about here in our drinking water, but in commercially produced quantities on the factory floor, oh yeah. It's vapor borne, uh, and it's dangerous as all hell. Um, these perfluoroalkyl acids are tremendously dangerous compounds. How many of you had organic chemistry? You may have heard of halogenated acid compounds. Some of those are horrifyingly dangerous in concentration. So it's a toxic substance, and that's important to know. <clears throat> so they began producing Gen X commercially as a product long about 2010. Timelines are working. In 2015, DuPont people got wind of a publication out of Mark Streiner's lab at EPA and Research Triangle Park documenting the presence of various fluorochemicals in the Cape Fear River. This, this set of studies goes back a while. Um, some of the earlier studies uh, predate that 2015 publication, but they requested conversation with DEQ about that. I don't know the outcome of that conversation. In 2016 is when things began to surface. Um, you may have heard of this paper. You can't see it from the distance, but this is the Sun et al. paper in which uh, Dr. Knoppe was the uh, last author, the senior guy. Uh, and this is the one that highlighted the fact that Gen X was in the water supply in the Cape Fear River and was getting through the treatment processes that provide us our drinking water here in Wilmington. Now, <clears throat> that's the publication date. The study itself was actually done in 2013. So the data were out there before that. As soon as that paper came out, Dr. Kanapi contacted Diener, or what is now DEQ, about that, who 
to alert them. Nothing happened. I'll, I'll highlight that again in a minute. Um, what made this a story was that the Star News on June 7th last year published a headline story about <coughs> toxin taint CFPUA water. And then it went public in a big way. You all know that part. of a letter written by the environmental manager, Michael Johnson, to Diener. I have a copy of that letter right here, if anyone wants to see it. It's a real interesting letter. It's in the public files. You can find it. <clears throat> and in this letter, he says that they're making fluorocarbon compounds, and they're being discharged in their wastewater through their wastewater treatment plant. Now their wastewater treatment plant on site is designed to treat domestic wastewater. They have 300 some people who work there. They have bathrooms. That facility is out in the countryside so they have to have their own wastewater treatment plant. It is not a treatment plant designed to handle fluorocarbons. They're biologically inert for most purposes. So, letter continues. Um, we generate dozens or hundreds of byproducts in very low concentrations. And they make the point that there is no standard method by which to identify or quantify these compounds. And I highlighted the standard method. Those of us in the business of studying water quality or managing water quality are aware that when we measure the properties of water for regulatory purposes, we have to do so using a standard method published, approved by EPA, using a certified laboratory and certified techniques. At that time, those techniques and those standard methods did not exist for most of these compounds, if any of them. So we had a problem there. Now, DuPont goes on to say that uh, we're going to use nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Now, how many of you know what that is? Oh, cool. So, if you know what that is, you also know that that is not the method you would choose to use for quantifying compounds. You would use mass spectrometry. Rob's going to tell you all about that. DuPont is probably the, the premier chemical company in the whole universe, unless they're aliens. Anybody ought to know how to identify and quantify compounds, especially the compounds they're producing. I would expect it would be DuPont. So when I read that, I thought, that's a bunch of BS. They know better. They're shining us on. <clears throat> and they made the same claim about exactly the same thing just a year ago oh, we have to use NMR and it's not sensitive enough and blah, blah, blah. Bullshit. No children. <laughs> now, Mr. Johnson goes on basically to say, oh, <laughs> turn it on. <laughs> you can hear me anyway, right? Yeah. Cool. All right, I teach for a living. That, um, I don't need it. How <laughs> <laughs> They know they're supposed to report the presence of any toxic pollutant in their discharge above a concentration of 100 micrograms per liter. So they know that these are toxic compounds that we're talking about. And they know they're supposed to disclose them in their permit applications. All right? Now, all right, lots of text here. It's a long letter. And they go through this thought exercise where they say, compound A, blah, blah, blah. We know that it's present at this concentration in the original wastewater from the process. 
And we can quantify that with NMR. Yeah, NMR can quantify things down to one or two milligrams per liter, okay, which is parts per million. Um, <clears throat> but then when it gets mixed with other wastewater and finally discharged, it'll be down below their detection limits, but still present at concentrations higher than the 100 microgram per liter limit for disclosure of toxic compounds. Okay, we can't measure it, we know it's there, and it's going to be above the concentration threshold that we should report. So, then they ask the question, do we really need to tell you about this? Wink, wink. Um, In this letter, they do not identify any compound. That means they have not disclosed the presence of any compound. All of this is cast as hypothetical. I have not been able to find a specific response to that question in the files. Now, I may not have looked thoroughly enough. Diener did send them a letter in reference to one of their permits uh, two years later um, that references the question about this Part 3C, this reporting requirement, but it didn't answer the question. It just said, well, we'll talk about it later. The plain fact is that DuPont's discharge permit, the NPDES permit, was renewed in 2007, and again in 2012. It's up for renewal now. The only perfluorinated compound mentioned in any of those permits is PFOA that legacy C8 compound I mentioned a while back. There is no mention of Gen X or any of those other compounds I had listed earlier. Not one. They're not in the permit. And in the 2012 permit, PFOA was only going to be monitored in the intake water, not the effluent. Okay. So then you ask, what did Diener and DEQ know and when did they know it? They knew that discharge was occurring back in 2002 because they were told in a certified letter from Mr. Johnson that, yeah, we're doing this. He didn't give any details, nothing much to act on, but he told them in writing. Diener knew in 2003 that the groundwater at the Kenmore's plant, when it was DuPont then, was contaminated with C8. There was a a group of folks working on a C8 problem because by then the community at large was aware, I mean the national community was aware that C8 was problematic for human health. We knew that. 2001, 2002, the C8 working group uh, was a group of folks that got together and, and pushed the regulators to take a hard look at PFOA, which was being produced at that time up at what is now the Chemar site. And they wrote a letter to Diener uh, right here in 2006, alleging a variety of violations and other problems with C8 production. I do not know the response to that. <clears throat> As I mentioned a few minutes ago, there was a publication in 2015 that was not the first, by the way, came out in this peer-reviewed scientific literature that made it clear that these compounds were present in the Cape Fear River and in the tissues of fishes and so forth and so on. DuPont requested a meeting with DEQ about that. I don't know the outcome of that meeting. Um, of course, the part of the story you all already know quite well is that Gen X was found in the CFR, the Cape Fear River, uh, and passing through the CFP ways drinking water treatment system, Brunswick County treatment system, and everyone else as of November 2016. And again, here's the pub that did that. Detlef Kanapi, whom you'll hear from shortly, notified Tom Reeder, the assistant or deputy secretary of DEQ, and uh, I believe it was November of 2016 about this and got no response. <coughs> Well, 
X hat. And what have we learned since the story broke? This is a, a very actively moving story. There are a lot more CFCs in the environment than were initially reported. Again, all the focus has been on Gen X. That's been the headline compound. We learned about Nathion byproducts last summer. Um, there's one that's present in very high concentrations relative to Gen X. Matter of fact, quite a few. One of them is this PFMOAA, perfluoromethoxy per acetic acid. None of those compounds were disclosed in any permit application. Not one. Okay. Even after Chemwars agreed on June 22nd last year to stop the discharge of Gen X, there have been some numbers of additional discharges. Then we found out that it's in the groundwater all around Chemwars, not just on the campus of the facility, but in the drinking water wells of their neighbors for some miles around the plant. And the UNCW folks, and Ralph will point this out again, found it in rainwater here in Wellington last fall. Lots of it. <clears throat> Come to find out it's being emitted from smokestacks up at the plant as aerial emissions. And apparently the aerial emissions were actually larger in quantity than the water discharges have been. All of this has come out in the last year or so. We also know that Gen X accumulates in sediments, uh, sediments in the river. Ralph's going to talk about that. It shows up in biofilms in water distribution systems. It shows up in the sediments and water heaters, which should make you unhappy. <clears throat> so, the question I started with, how do we get here? As I said, it's not a happy story. This is a system failure. The system we have in place for regulating these kinds of compounds failed. Failed in a lot of ways. First of all, to a great degree, the permitting and monitoring programs we have in place are trust me systems. These companies are self-monitoring. They are expected to disclose honestly what is in their discharges. And they're expected then to monitor for those honestly and to report those concentrations. It's not easy to cheat, but it can be done. Okay, and they did. Quite obviously from this history, this timeline of things, I can <coughs> safely say that the regulators involved failed to pursue the obvious questions, unless they're things that are not in the written, written record that actually happened and so forth. I don't know. But it looks to me like what should have been done way back was not done. The right questions were not asked. I have to wonder if there was some reluctance to enforce strictly the provisions of the Clean Water Act. I don't know the answer to that. That goes to motive, intent. I would say as a broader problem that these emerging contaminants, the new chemicals that we find out about only after they've been in production for a little while, represent a serious challenge to our regulatory system couple of things right off the top. We know very little about them. There's very limited animal testing on the safety of Gen X. There is no testing whatsoever on any of those byproducts. Any of them. They are totally unknown in terms of toxicity or threat. How do you regulate something when you don't know anything about it and when nobody tells you it's there? <clears throat> One of the important things to bear in mind is we can develop methods for finding these compounds, and again, Ralph will tell you about that, but we have to have certified standard methods for doing that. That takes time. That is built into the, the very nature of this system. And that is a real problem. It's a scientific problem. It's a problem of will, funding, and so forth. The standard methods for testing for these compounds have been very slow to develop. They're very difficult to analyze. That doesn't mean we can't do it. We can, okay? Quite frankly, environmental science in general can't keep up. 
is there Gen X in the plant flora around the Chemwars plant? I don't know. If you raise a garden downwind of, of Chemwars, are your tomatoes safe to eat? I don't know. There's a whole lot of things like that. We don't know. Okay? And after all of these discharges have taken place, the urgency to answer those questions and the resources necessary to get those answers haven't matched up. Now, the final point here is, of course, as you well know, and I, I think there was only one politician in the room, right? And Phil, you're not really a politician. I mean, who's your major campaign contributor? Um, himself. Himself, okay, yeah. Well, that's good. Um, they control the regulatory system, okay? And, and the last thought I'll leave you with is, well, we have a free press and we have elections. So if you want to make change, that's how you do it. All right, I'll stop. Um, panel seems to be asking questions at that point. Our next speaker is...